Hi guys, I'm Chris McDade, chef owner of Popina in Brooklyn, New York. This is Artful Italian, where I teach you how to cook Italian food that is seasonal, simple, and most importantly, delicious. Today, I'm gonna to teach you how to cook three dishes. Uh, to start, we're gonna do a roasted asparagus with a little bit of Parmesan cheese and a fried egg. After that, we're gonna go into bucatini and machicana. It's one of my all-time favorite pastas. It's tomatoey, it's porky, it's a little spicy. Then we're gonna finish with a beautiful lamb shoulder chop, some spring onions, uh, and a very vibrant salsa verde. All right, y'all, to get us started, we're going to begin with the asparagus. Uh, what I love about this asparagus dish is it is seasonal, simple, and makes you feel a little bit luxurious with just things that you usually already have on hand. So we're gonna start with the asparagus, a little bit of olive oil. Not too much, because you're gonna put more in the pan later when we start to cook it. A little bit of kosher salt. A few cracks of black pepper. We're just gonna roll it around a little bit. Now we're gonna go back to the stove and get it in the pan. All right, so before we put the asparagus in the pan, we wanna make sure we preheat our oven, your highest setting, 500. It's not gonna be in there long. Basically, once we get everything together, we're just gonna put it in there to kind of melt the cheese, heat everything back through. A Little bit of olive oil. I got this guy over medium high heat. We're gonna add the asparagus. And basically what we're trying to do is just cook it through, right? You want to make sure a little bit of color is fine. You don't want anything crazy. You don't want it to be charred. You really want the asparagus uh, to shine through. So some people uh, might call this asparagus a la Bismarck. I'm not exactly sure why they call it that. I think it has something to do with, uh, there's, a, there's like an explorer back in the day, last name Bismarck. You crack the egg on top at the end, it kind of looks like his hat. Uh, all right, so the asparagus is about halfway through. So now we're gonna cook our egg. Again, a little bit more oil. Yeah, we're gonna let the pan heat up a little bit because we want the, the whites to kind of crisp up a little bit and puff uh, without letting the egg, the yolk, cook too much. Pinch of salt. There you go, this asparagus looks good. I'm gonna turn it off. And while we're waiting for this egg to fry up, we're just gonna pop it in the oven 30 seconds. All right, it's been about 30 seconds. The egg should be set. We're just gonna pull it out. And then we're gonna take everything back to our cutting board. All right, y'all, so to minimize dishes and clean up, we're gonna try to build everything in here. So we have our roasted asparagus. It's gonna take a little mayonnaise. Gonna spread it out. Doesn't have to be perfect. We 
You want a decent amount of coverage, but you also want to kind of, at the top of the spears, you don't want to cover the top of the spears with the mayonnaise. We want those to shine through when we get ready to plate. So asparagus, Parmesan cheese, Then we're gonna pop it right back in the oven, maybe another 30 seconds. All right, it's been about 30 seconds. Pan out. Cheese is just slightly melted. Again, we don't want that much color. And then if you have a spatula, I think that's the best way. We're gonna move it over onto the plate. All right, we're gonna take our fried egg, right on top, a little bit more cheese. And then I like a fair share of black pepper. And there you go. It's a great side item, quick and easy lunch, maybe with a piece of toast or delicious and luxurious breakfast. All right, y'all, so next up, we have our Bucatini and Matcha Chana. Uh, again, this is a very simple pasta dish to put together, and it is one of the quintessential pastas in the Roman pasta canon. So to start, we have whole, tomatoes. This is our bucatini pasta. We make it in-house at Popina. Uh, what's cool about bucatini, it's a little bit thicker spaghetti. It has a hole that drives through the middle. Uh, the idea behind the hole is so that it can catch all that sauce and uh, just deliver a lot of flavor in every bite. Next up we have our guanciale. Uh, guanciale is similar to pancetta except it's made out of the jowl. So uh, it's cured pork jowl, pecorino fulvia romano, uh, any Pecorino Romano will work. Fulvia is nice uh, because it is one of the last Pecorinos still made in Lazio, but also it has like a sharp salinity that you miss in a lot of other uh, Pecorinos. Chili flake and black pepper. So the first thing I did was throw a pot of water on. We want it to be boiling when we're ready to drop the pasta. And now we're just gonna mise everything out. So first we're gonna start with our guanciale. We want quarter inch slices, right? So. We're gonna cut down like this. If a quarter inch seems a little thin for you, it's fine. If you don't feel that comfortable doing it, cut them a little bit thicker, but the key is to make sure they're all the same thickness so that when we go to cook it, render out that fat, we don't end up some, with some that are like super crispy and on the edge of being burnt, while others are still a little loose, flabby, and not exactly where we want them to be. So this happens to be a more meaty version of guanciale. Uh, a lot of times it's like you'll see just like a thin layer of meat running through uh, and it's mostly fat. Put them together so that when we go through, we can make them all the same size. Uh, earlier I mentioned that Amacha Chana is one of the pastas in the Roman canon. So if you can imagine Amacha Chana and you were to remove the tomato and add an egg, you would have carbonara. If you were just to remove the tomato and guanciale, you would have cacio pepe. And if you were to remove just the tomato, you would have pasta alla gricia. So they're all built on the backbone of pecorino, black pepper, and water. And then it's the addition of tomato or guanciale that takes them to the next level. This is crushed. We're gonna hand crush these guys. So the reason I like to hand crush them and not use, I mean, Certainly you can use a tomato sauce or tomato puree, but the reason I like to hand crush them is so that the sauce has a little bit of texture. And also there's no added flavorings, right? So there's no basil in there, there's no kind of garlic. Uh, this pasta is all about the ingredients you see in front of you, the guanciale, the tomato, and the pecorino. All right, so crush, nothing crazy. Uh, like I said, a little chunky is okay, right? It makes your, it makes each bowl of pasta a little bit unique and gives it its own character. Now that we have everything prepped out, we're gonna head on over to the stove and get the pasta going.
All right, so we got everything at the stove, right? We've got our black pepper, our chili flake, our pasta, our pecorino cheese, and our guanciale. So to start, we're just gonna put a tiny bit of oil. You don't even necessarily need oil. There's so much fat in the guanciale, but it does help get things rolling a little bit. So again, I'm over medium high heat here. And what we're trying to do is we want to coax all that fat out of the guanciale, right? We don't want it to crisp up and give us like this toasted fat flavor. We want more of like a raw pork, black pepper, uh, and in this instance, there's a little bit of rosemary in the cure uh, to come through. So we're just gonna slowly render this out. While this is rendering, you can salt your water. So I like to season my water to where it's a little bit less than a salty sea. So like slightly salty ocean water. Uh, but that can also depend on like what you're making, right? So if you're making maybe pasta pomodoro or it's just tomato sauce, you could afford to salt your water a little bit more heavily. Uh, in our case, we have a salty guanciale and also salty pecorino. So you just wanna be mindful of that when you are uh, salting your water. So you can really start to smell the, this is like one of my all-time favorite smells is, I mean, in this instance, it's guanciale, but anything, pancetta, bacon. Uh, it might be my second favorite smell in the kitchen next to like a giant piece of pork being basted with like lots of garlic, thyme, and butter. All right. So we'll probably let this cook for another 30 seconds or so. I'm gonna crank the heat up just a little. Give our water a little taste. Perfect. All right, and at this point, I'm gonna turn the heat off. So basically what we're gonna do is we're just gonna like gently toast the black pepper and the chili flake. If it was rolling full steam, uh, you'd be more inclined to burn it. So we're gonna go in with the black pepper. It's maybe quarter teaspoon. Pinch of chili flake. This is really up to you, right? So that's probably not spicy and then this is kind of somewhere in the middle if you like it a little bit more than that you're obviously you're more than welcome to add another pinch of chili and then we're going to add our tomato this is about four ounces of tomato all right and now the goal is to infuse that tomato with as much of that fat as we can so i'm going to go ahead and turn this back on kind of like a low heat, just so it gently simmers away. Now we're gonna go with the pasta. So this is fresh pasta. Um, it'll take anywhere from four to maybe five and a half minutes, depending on how many days ago it was made. Uh, if you're using dried pasta, then it's just gonna take a lot longer, probably anywhere from like eight to 15 minutes, depending on the pasta that you choose. A general rule of thumb is the longer it takes to cook, the better pasta quality it is. Uh, when you're looking at dried pasta, you wanna look at it and make sure you can see texture. There's a little bit of like white starchiness on the outside. Um, that is going to, one, not only give you a better al dente noodle, uh, which it just means like to the bite or a little toothsome, but it's also gonna fill your pasta water with a lot more starch. And so, you can add all the butter and cheese in the world that you want to to your pasta, and it's gonna be creamy and buttery and cheesy, but the pasta water is the key to a perfectly cohesive pasta sauce. So like if you go out to eat in an Italian restaurant that cooks a lot of pasta, they have a big tank, it looks like a, like a commercial deep fryer almost, it just boils water. Your pasta that you get at 8.30 is gonna be better than that pasta that you get at 5.30 just because so many orders of pasta have been dropped in there and now there's like these starchy bubbles that float all over the top and it's perfect and it's almost quintessential for pastas that don't have butter and cheese. So something, maybe it's like a vegan pasta, it's garlic, olive oil, chili flake, parsley. If you're going in there with just raw water, you're gonna end up with a loose oily sauce to where if you have a water that's a bit starchy, uh, the sauce is definitely gonna feel a lot more creamy. Uh, so if, you're, if you are cooking at home, right, and obviously you're not gonna have this giant pasta tank full of starchy water, a good trick is to just like take a tablespoon of semolina and throw it in there, let it kind of do its thing, and it'll add starch to your water automatically. All right, 
it's starting to smell really good. Uh, you can kind of see the tomato has a shine to it, which means it's taking in all of that fat. Uh, I think a matcha china might be my favorite pasta. Cacio pepe is right up there as well, just because it's so simple uh, and really uses ingredients that you can find in any Italian pantry. So we're gonna check the noodle. And anytime you read on a package how long the noodle takes, or you listen to somebody like me about how long the noodle takes, you always wanna test it about a minute too early, or I mean a minute early, because what you don't want to end up with is overcooked pasta noodles. Yeah, so we're close, maybe about 30 seconds. I'm gonna crank this guy up a little bit more. Then I'm gonna add about two ounces of our pasta water. So when I go to pull these noodles out, I'm gonna use tongs. If you're at home and you feel more comfortable putting them through a strainer, just make sure you reserve some of that pasta water. The last thing you wanna have happen is for this sauce to get tight and you have no way to loosen it except for water out of your faucet. All right, sauce is bubbling. Out comes our bucatini. And now here it's all about stirring and tossing. You wanna make sure you can coax as much of that starch out of that bucatini while making sure the fat and the water are all emulsified so you don't end up with a greasy sauce. We're just gonna let it rest just slightly to reduce some of that sauce. Again, and when you're reducing the sauce, you want to err on the side of it being too tight then too loose before you add the cheese, because uh, we can always thin it out with our pasta water. All right, so you can see it's pretty tight, but there's still a little bit of sauce in the pan. So I'm gonna turn this off. Uh, when we add cheese, we never want it to see the heat again. If you add the cheese and you start to cook it, basically your black pepper, your chili flake, the, anything you have is gonna start to stick to the pan. So here we go. Fulvi Romano. I'm just gonna stir that in. All right, now we're gonna go get it in the bowl. All right, next up, my favorite part. Let's get this in the bowl, shower it with some more cheese, and taste our handiwork. Cheese. You can really smell the pecorino once it hits the hot pasta. It smells so good. All right. I feel slightly sorry for you guys that you don't get to take a bite of this right now. Delicious. It's on my face. Wouldn't have it any other way. Bucatini and Machichana. All right, so uh, next up, last course, lamb shoulder steak. We're gonna serve it with some roasted spring onions and a little bit of salsa verde. Uh, what I love about the lamb shoulder steak is it is definitely cheaper than lamb chops, lamb loin. Uh, it is full of fat and there's generally more than one bone running through it. So uh, that's gonna help keep your meat moist and juicy. So first step, we have a uh, cast iron pan behind me. We're on like medium high heat. So first, a little bit of salt. I know it looks like a lot, but this is why restaurant food tastes better than food at home. Good amount of black pepper. Kind of push that in, flip it, same thing. So this lamb has been sitting out for maybe an hour. Uh, anytime you cook meat at home, it's a good idea to pull it out at least 30 minutes, an hour if you can, and let it sit on your counter. Uh, just gonna bring everything to room temperature and make everything cook a lot more evenly and quicker. All right, so lamb. Next up, we're gonna get these onions ready because they are gonna go straight into the pan once we pull the lamb out. So these are red spring onions. If they're thin like this one, you can pretty much leave them the way they are. If they're a little bit thicker of a bulb like this, we're just simply just gonna cut them in half. 
at the bulb, right? If the greens are nice, you can leave them on. Let's take our onions and our lamb and head to this pan. All right, so we have a preheated cast iron, medium high heat. You want it hot, right? You want it to be able to get some nice color on the outside of that lamb without cooking it all the way through. Also, the oven is still on from when we did the asparagus. Uh, that's gonna come into play when we are roasting the onions, but also when we are reheating the lamb once it's had time to rest. So, a little bit of olive oil. Smoking is good. We're gonna go in with the lamb. Now, you can certainly do this on a grill, a grill pan, just anything that is hot, right? Like if, if I did this in my apartment in New York, fire alarm would be going off, smoke would be filling up the house. So if you have the opportunity to do it outside on a grill, uh, I would take it full advantage of that. Uh, whenever I'm cooking meat, I like to move it around, right? I'm not, I don't believe in like the only flip it once, cross hatch, whatever. Because uh, basically what you want to do, the more you move it, the more nooks and crannies you're giving yourself. So you're going to develop different kinds of flavor profiles. You're going to develop different sorts of textures. The seasoning is going to hit in different ways. So you can just kind of move it, shake it, especially with a grill. So for something that's on a grill, I like to put the meat on, let it sit for maybe a minute and then rip it off. And you'll see there's like, it really creates like textures and grooves uh, that just is gonna take the flavor of whatever you're cooking to the next level. So we're gonna pair this up with some salsa verde. Salsa verde is very Italian. It's a traditional accompaniment to roasted meats. Um, and it's a great way to use up any herbs that you might have overgrown in your garden or uh, if you're like me, you go to the grocery store and you buy a bunch of rosemary, you only need two sprigs and then there's 35 sprigs left in your refrigerator and you're not sure what to do with them. Um, so for the one we're gonna do, it's gonna be parsley and mint, right? Mint, mint and jelly, super traditional pairing for lamb. Um, it's also gonna have a little bit of anchovy in it anchovy uh, and the Italian lexicon of food also pairs very well with lamb. Well, with a lot of things actually. I mean, you can leave it out for all, by all means if you don't think you like anchovies, but I would give it a shot. So now I'm just gonna render out that fat on top a little bit. All right, so at this point, we're gonna start to get some of these onions in the pan. It's okay if the greens are sticking out, not a big deal. In case you haven't noticed, I like to cook with as few pans and dishes as possible. I love to cook, I love to eat, I hate cleaning up. So, asparagus, one pan, Pasta, well, two pans if you count the water. Steak, one pan. All right, our lamb is just about there. So we're gonna pull it. We're gonna let this rest. While the steak is resting, we're gonna throw the onions in the, in the oven so that they can finish cooking. While the onions are resting, we're gonna head back over and make up our salsa verde. All right guys, so now we're gonna go to the Salsa Verde. First, we're gonna start by chopping up some capers. I'm gonna use about a tablespoon of capers here. And nothing fancy, just a rough chop. Run your knife through it a few times. This dish is very rustic, so, which means your knife skills don't need to be that sharp. All right, in the bowl. We're gonna go with the anchovy fillets. I love anchovies. They are 
kind of like a secret ingredient in a lot of the dishes we do at Popina. Uh, I also have a book coming out called The Magic of Tin Fish, which focuses uh, not only on anchovies, but all sorts of tin fish. Anything from anchovies and sardines, to octopus and sea urchin. Uh, they're a great way to pack a lot of flavor cheaply and sustainably into your food. All right, so we're gonna take the anchovies and the capers, a little bit of olive oil. And just kind of mash those together a little. So we're gonna take a large clove of garlic. I'm gonna take that brown part off. And then again, doesn't need to be anything fancy. Just gonna run our knives through it a few times. And like I mentioned earlier, this you can put anything you want. Like a lot of people like to put mustard in there. Uh, different kinds of acidity. We're going to use red wine vinegar today, but lemon juice is certainly okay. All right, garlic goes in. And then onto the herbs. So today we're using mint and parsley. Uh, but like we talked about over there again, tarragon is good, rosemary is good, chervil is good, kind of whatever you have on hand and you need to use up. So mint, we're just going to kind of line the leaves up all together going in the same direction. And then we're just going to run our knife through thinly one way. And we'll turn it and run our knife back through thinly the other way into the bowl. And we'll do the same thing with the parsley. So, all right, we're going to get the parsley together, thin one way, and then we'll turn it back and go thin the other way. We're going to add a little bit more oil. So this oil is actually imported from a Bruto from a good friend of mine named Bob Marcelli. Uh, his family has an agriturismo uh, in the mountain regions of Abruzzo, and this oil is some of the best you can get, which is one of the reasons why it's coming out so slow, because you can see they put a tamper lid on. Uh, in the past few years, there's been a lot of basically fraud happening in the Italian olive oil industry. People will buy the olives or the oil from somewhere else, bottle it like it's Italian, and try to pawn it off as something that it's not. So again, we're gonna mix this stuff together. A little splash of red wine vinegar. Now we're ready to go check on the onions. All right, so we're gonna go grab the onions out. This, the lamb has had plenty of time to rest. We're gonna get it on a plate, take a bite, enjoy it. This is what we're looking for. Nice char on the onions. We have our lamb, our salsa verde, and our plate. So the plate up is very simple. First we're gonna take our lamb, place it down, take some of our charred onions here, and lay those over the top. And then this is something I like to do whenever I'm cooking any sort of meat at home. I'll take the juices from the lamb, kind of add them to the salsa verde so that we don't lose any of that salty resting flavor. Give this a good mix. And go right over the top. All right, and here we have it. Lamb shoulder steak, charred spring onions, a little salsa verde, perfect springtime meat dish. Let's get in there and see how this bad boy tastes. So good. You get the freshness from the herbs. You get some salinity from the anchovies and the capers. A little bit of gaminess from the lamb. And then you get that sharp, bright acidity coming from the red wine vinegar. It's my favorite part actually, it's all fat. 
There you have it. All right, guys, thank you so much for following along. I hope you guys found today to be as insightful and delicious as I did. Uh, if you have any questions about the show, anything that involves Italian cooking at all, please hit me up on Instagram, at Always Anchovy. You can go to the website for my restaurant, at popinanyc.com. And please, please, please pre-order my book coming out June 18th. It's called The Magic of Tin Fish. All the beautiful ways and delicious ways to cook with tin seafood. Until next time, mangiare.